Welcome everyone to Scheller Lunchtime Live, a live stream series hosted by the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business. My name is Lindsay Kane, and I'm the Associate Director of Client Relationships for non-degree executive education programs. On Select Fridays at 12 p.m. Eastern, you'll have the chance to hear from Scheller faculty, student, and alumni speakers as they discuss relevant topics for the tech-driven digital age. At Scheller, we're proud to offer undergraduate MBA and PhD programs, along with open enrollment and custom executive education programs. It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Buchanan, senior lecturer at the Scheller College of Business. He teaches undergraduate and MBA courses in marketing with a focus on digital and online marketing channels. In addition to his teaching role at Georgia Tech, he actively consults in the field of digital marketing and technology with an emphasis on digital strategy, lead generation, customer retention, social media marketing, digital brand creation, integrated marketing communications planning, buyer path analysis, and team leadership. Today, Michael will provide a brief history of social interactions and key consumer trends on social media. He'll explain how brands are capitalizing on social commerce and offer his predictions on what it means for consumers and e-tailers. As always, feel free to ask questions in the comments section. Michael will address as many questions as possible at the end of his presentation. Over to you, Michael. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. And hi, everyone, thank you for joining in today. I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about what's changing in the world of social, specifically in this space of commerce. And a quick agenda here. So just as we start, I'll talk about a, a quick definition and some basic insights related to social commerce. And then we'll move into looking at some of the evolutions that have occurred around a few of the key platforms. I'll share with you some business cases so we can see the application of this in real world examples. And then we'll wrap up today talking a little bit about the future of social commerce. And we should get through this in somewhere around 22 to 25 minutes today. Okay, so let's take a quick look at a definition just to ground ourselves on what social commerce is. So social commerce was coined in 2005. And a definition to ground us here is the process of using social media to facilitate the purchase of sale of products and services. And the reason why I chose to underline facilitate is because sometimes we can get caught up in thinking that social commerce is just simply e-commerce on social platforms. And that's part of it. But it's also about the nurturing of moving a customer through the buyer journey from discovery through to consideration and ultimately to making decisions as well. So it's a bit more holistic than just making purchases on social. You all are probably aware of this, but when we look at the proliferation of social media usage uh, globally speaking, we see that a little over half of all people are engaging with social media. And here in the United States, we have roughly three out of four people are using social media um, in one form or another. So we're continuing to see increases globally in the use and even some incremental lift in the United States as well over time. All right, so let's take a look at just some really quick facts here before we jump into the section related to the platforms. So the U.S. retail social commerce sales has been increasing here in recent years. And not surprisingly, when we saw what happened with, with COVID and more people turned to online behavior, we saw an increase in social media usage. And in part because of the new native functionality within social platforms, we saw more commerce starting to transpire there. And in fact, what we're expecting in 2021 is approximately the same growth rate. Um, but with that being said, when we look at these numbers, and just to reinforce here in billions of dollars, this still only represents roughly 4% of US e-commerce sales. So although we're seeing some pretty big increases um, um, here, it's still a small portion of total e-commerce sales. And to also ground you in a little bit of user data, when we look at people in the demographic of roughly 18 to 34 years old, we see that there are a large number of them that are already making purchases on these social platforms. And they're not just small purchases, they're actually um, fairly significant with regard to average order value. The latest data I saw was approximately $80 was the average order price on social commerce. 
just to give you a comparison here, we all recognize that China has you know 4.2 times the population that the U.S. does. But what we see here is that they have a 10x multiplier with regard to social commerce sales. So they've actually been leading the way with regard to consumer adoption and integration of functionality into their social platform. So here in the United States, we're doing a little bit of catching up. And in fact, live streaming actually started in China. And over there, their social commerce represents approximately 14% of all commerce sales. Okay, so let's look as we start to move into talking a little bit about the platforms themselves. When we look at the ways that consumers are making purchases on social platforms and which ones that they're using, it's helpful to understand who's kind of leading the pack here. And I'm going to focus the talk today mostly on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest because that's where we see the vast majority of activity uh, occurring. In some of the cases, I'll call out a, a, an alternate example, but this is where we're seeing most consumers starting to engage the most on social commerce from a platform perspective. So now let's take a look at what's been happening over the past few years with regard to platform evolution. So Facebook launched Marketplace in 2007. And just to get this out there, for those of you that were using Facebook in 2007, you're probably feel, feeling a little bit of a chill go down your spine when you take a look at this as a throwback to uh, what Facebook looked looked like at the at the time. But that's it. That's okay. I was there as well. Some cold comfort. But nonetheless, Facebook launches Marketplace in 2007, and actually seven years later, they removed it. So they continued to chip away at some functionality to try to drive greater consumer engagement and then decided to actually pull back from it. And then three years after that, in 2017, they launched it again. And then Facebook started to focus on a little different way to engage consumers. So they launched Facebook Shop in 2015, which is also known as Store. And we can see that highlighted over here on the left side navigation. So what this does is it allows customers to view and purchase products directly from a user's Facebook page, along with the option to check out without leaving Facebook. Now for us, maybe currently, especially if you're an active social user or, a, or an active social commerce um, engager, then what you probably say to yourself is, yeah, it feels like I've been doing that for a while. But when they introduce the ability to retain that commerce functionality directly within the platform, that was a bit of a game changer for us from a consumer standpoint. Now, if you actually operate a store, you can link off to your um, to your website as well. But the main value proposition was we get to commerce and engage right there within the platform itself. So now fast forward to a bit more current time and let's look at what happened during last summer where in May of 2020, Facebook shop changed a, a little bit. So the way they defined shop was a, a place to discover businesses and look for products within the Facebook app. And they created this tab to be resident so that consumers who were moving through the navigation would begin to make that sort of a part of their experience. And what they really wanted to do is showcase a range of businesses that are selling products, you know, directly on the platform. And, and in fact, what Facebook is actually starting to do is to test some options with using Facebook Live and adding other promotional options to consider to help engage customers more and keep the business right there within their platform. So now let's shift away from Facebook to, well, what is now a Facebook owned um, social platform and talk a little bit about Instagram. So in March of 2019, Instagram launched their checkout feature. And when they did this, they had just 26 brands that were, were using this functionality and they're you know, common who's who brands like Warby Parker, Nike was one of the first ones, Zara, the apparel brand, right? So they were part of the, the test group at the time. And when using Instagram checkout, what customers can do is they can tap to view a product from a shoppable post and then continue to the payment process all while remaining once again, 
within the platform. So you're going to see a common theme here where naturally what these platform providers are doing is trying to keep people integrated into their ecosystem and not leaving it to conduct their shopping experiences you know, off on a website. So all you have to do in this instance, if you're a consumer, you enter in your name, your email address, your billing information, where you want the product shipped to, and you can check out right there within the platform itself. So in March of 2020, Instagram created what's called Shopping for Creators. As many of you are probably very well aware, we have uh, an additional area of focus that has become a hot button for marketers in the past few years with regard to influencer marketing. And so we see now that there are actually over 200 million users who visit at least one business profile on Instagram every single day. So 200 million user, users visiting a business profile every day. And over 80% of these, those users indicate that they discover new products and services on this platform. So this is becoming a, a really hot area for marketers to focus their energy on. So it's no surprise that Instagram's making strides with regard to connecting the dots between brands and shoppers. Now, what they have done is they provide an opportunity for influencers and content creators to add product tags to their posts from brand partners, right? So what they're actually doing is trying to create an ecosystem where these influencers can connect with product providers and facilitate a shopping experience directly within the platform. Now, at last check, I don't believe that they've still rolled out an affiliate component on this yet. But regardless of that functionality, um, you can imagine that influencers are going to change how they they charge customers or, or the brands that they're promoting on behalf of to you know, highlight the products on their on their platforms. So in the summer of last year during COVID, Instagram released shop and what we see here was, and by the way, they launched this first in, in the United States, and they gave people the opportunity to browse various uh, selections of products and to be able to filter by categories such as home goods. Of course, apparel is a very hot area. And then once again, to be able to make purchases within the application itself. And what they also did here in terms of, of, of building out their core user functionality is that they added an icon to the navigation so that you can get to Instagram shop with just one tap. So what we're seeing from both Facebook and Instagram is making that in principle a direct part of the user experience. Now let's transition over to Pinterest and we'll rewind the clock a little bit here and go back to March of 2019 where they made shoppable pins available. And what it is essentially is, is the, the, if you will, a, a Google of all things, you know, do it your, yourself, home decor and fashion. That's the way a lot of people think about Pinterest. And when we look at um, the engagement level on Pinterest, we see that 93% of active pinners say that they use Pinterest to plan for purchases. So this platform is becoming a very common one for consumers to think about how they go about looking at diversity of products and various options that are available while they're within the buyer journey. So as you can imagine, Pinterest wants to capitalize on that and keep people contained within their, their platform. So now what you can do actually when you create a, a pin is you can take a a, a piece of your photo and you can highlight it and you can copy and paste a link into a product page from your website. And then what Pinterest does is it'll pull in all of that information into the post here so that the user can continue to engage, you know, see pricing and so forth and all within the spirit of trying to keep the customer within the platform and facilitating their shopping there. So a bit more recently in June of this year, Pinterest released their shopping list feature and they launched this in both the United States and the UK with an expectation that it would roll out to some other markets like France, Germany and Canada um, later in the year. And so what it's intended to do is when we as users create um, pins, 
what they want to do is to automatically sh save those shoppable product pins. And then in addition to that, what it will do is actually notify us as a consumer when we see pricing changes for those products. So one of the things that Pinterest is being very thoughtful about is how when consumers shop for products, they're exploring around, they're assessing things like options, but also we're making price point decisions. You know, maybe this isn't a thing that I can afford right now, or I see the value of it at this point in time, but if the price comes down, maybe I'll be interested in engaging with it, you know, at a later time. So showing them shipping costs, reviews, you know, and notifying them is a really big game changer in terms of user experience here. So let's now take a dive into some business cases here and look at how some brands have been capitalizing on social commerce. So I mentioned Nike earlier, and we can see an example here where Nike was releasing their Air Jordan 3 shoe and i'm going to use a couple of shoe shoe products or uh, and apparel as examples here in, in the use cases so what nike did was that they took to partnering with snapchat this one was actually launched on snapchat and they released this product during if i remember right i think that it was during the nba all-star game i'm fairly certain that was that was the case and so for people who attended the post game after party, they were able to scan snap codes to purchase the product. So it gave them a sense of also being able to be, you know, one of the first to make a purchase. And for what it's worth, they actually sold out of the product in under a half an hour. I think it was like 23 minutes that they sold out of, of the product. So Nike was a bit of a first mover here with regard to using e-commerce to highlight a product launch. Now, shifting gears a little bit, I talked some about Facebook shops earlier, and you, you may or may not be familiar with Zimba. Zimba is a teeth whitening product company. And what they wanted to do is to test Facebook shops to determine whether or not they could attract shoppers, you know, boost brand awareness, and actually drive sales through the platform. So they end up launching this campaign through Facebook shops. And what they saw was within the first 60 days, they had 1,200 incremental product orders through the platform. And the other thing that I find very fascinating as a, as a marketer and, and someone focused on digital is not only were they gathering or gaining sales here in Facebook shops, what they also saw is that the average order value was about 7% higher than when people came to the website. Now, there's probably some social psychology and some other consumer behavior attributes that, that play a role in that. But nonetheless, what we see is not only a deep sense of engagement and the willingness to purchase, but also purchase at a higher price point. That's something that I think will be very interesting for brands to monitor and consider as they move forward in exploring social commerce. So back to another shoe example here with a competing brand, right? Adidas and how they were using Instagram reminders for the release of uh, their Donald Glover shoe. And if you're maybe not familiar with the name Donald Glover, you might recognize him better by, um, by his artistic name, which is Childish Gambino. And what we can see here is how the brand could create some hype through their Instagram stories around launching this product and letting consumers know what date and time that it would be released. And they're able to incorporate in additional imagery of what the product looks like, of course, the pricing information, and even get consumers even deeper engaged by selecting the size of their shoe here. And then presuming they've got reminders, or I'm sorry, notifications, turned on, what they would see is what's shown in this image on the right-hand side here, where they would get a post giving them an indication that the product was about to be released as a reminder to deepen engagement there. So a great way to use Instagram reminders to get people excited about a product release and notify them once that is happening. So let's take a look at one more example here with regard to Pinterest and the company Room and Board. 
And so what Room and Board wants to do, of course, is to share with consumers the various array of home good products that they have and provide an opportunity for people to you know, browse their selections and determine their own personal style related to their product searches. And so what they saw is when using promoted um, pins, and this was during a four month um, time period, they realized a 51x return on ad spend. So for those of you who are marketers, you think quite a lot about ROAS or return on ad spend. And so its shopping campaign received a ROAS of 33x by using these shoppable pins within Pinterest. Now, we're probably going to see additional functionality roll out. Pinterest has actually been very progressive about developing their platform and creating additional ways for brands to engage there. But what we, we already see are some great examples of where brands are using this functionality to engage consumers and then realize highly impactful results. So now let's talk a little bit in a, for, for a few minutes about the future of social commerce, and then I'll, I'll wrap up and take some questions that, that you have. No one has a crystal ball, but one of the things that we see that we care about are some projections. And it's estimated that in the next seven years that B2C e-commerce will be representative of, of half will be represented as half by social commerce. And that's expected to be about $3.4 trillion. Yep, that's with a T and not a B here. And we're expecting a CAGR of 28.4% during that time period, right? So that's a pretty healthy growth rate to get to that point in time and an expectation that half of projected commerce will be represented through social. And remember right now in the United States, that's only 4%. So that's a pretty hefty lift of expectation. I think one of the additional things we're of course going to continue to see are other social platforms incorporating in social commerce. Uh, for example, TikTok and Shopify had a recently uh, announced a platform integration to allow for greater opportunity to search for products, see product listings, and make purchases within the platform. If you're not familiar with Shopify, they're a Canadian-based e-commerce platform. They have uh, about 1.7 million businesses on there, and they process nearly $63 billion dollars and commerce sales. So I think we'll certainly see more integration with our commerce um, technologies with these social platforms to make it easier for brands to leverage social to engage customers right there. All right. I made reference earlier to live commerce being launched initially in the China market. And when we look at live commerce, there's some very compelling statistics related to this space. And it's an area that is continuing to grow. So when we look at what, com um, I'm sorry, live streamers are doing and the types of categories that they're focused on, you're going to see the typical expected who's who uh, product categories, apparel and fashion, consumer electronics, home decor, and beauty. But what we also want to take into consideration is how various demographics are adapting to social becoming just a normal part, part of what they do and how they go about being influenced in making buying decisions. So when we look at younger generations, you know, millennials, uh, Gen Z, uh, iGen, what we're starting to see is that there's a much greater use of social, a higher comfort level, and then also even the influence of celebrities and, and, and other types of influencers to uh, encourage and to help them figure out what are the products that they care about that they aspire to. So I think we'll continue to see live commerce unfold in a way that is more profound for the user experience so that as they follow these influencers and engage in content that they care about, there'll be opportunities for those influencers and those brands to synergistically provide products and the opportunity for consumers who care about them to make those purchases or to store them 
directly within the platforms. And one other really quick example here, and this is a, a company that is uh, that is operating in Brazil and and Peru. And what they have done is they have started, it's called Favo or Favo, F-A-V-O. And what they're starting to do is to leverage the power of community group buying. So what they're doing is encouraging their entrepreneurs, as they call them, to take their following, the people that listen to what they say, that believe in them and trust them as, as a brand, to capture demand for products and so that now rather than as an individual consumer me saying you know okay i'm interested in, in purchasing whatever that you know this this certain product is but rather what if a hundred or a thousand or five thousand of us have interest in that product and, and what's really interesting for them is that they're focused on grocery stores and supermarkets so they haven't even tapped into things like you know automobiles or consumer electronics and what they are are doing right now is they have 2000 retail items that they're able to provide to their customer base at highly reduced rates because of the volume purchasing behavior and i think that we're likely to see that right we've all been on social and are using it more regularly and more heavily so what i think we're going to see here is brands getting smart and intermediaries getting smart about how we aggregate bulk demand over time. So that's a very high level of what's transpiring with regard to social commerce. We've got a few minutes remaining today. I hope some of those cases and platform evolution was valuable. Feel free to get in contact with me at a later time. I've got my email address and LinkedIn profile link here. With that being said, Lindsay, if there are a couple of questions in chat, I'll be happy to talk about them. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so do you know, do these platforms receive a percentage of the sale by allowing an e-tailer to use the platform? Yeah, so these platforms, this has been evolving so fast that I think this is also part of the future. We're going to see some changes with regard to how that happens. I know many of us recognize that you know, when you go sell products on Amazon, Amazon charges you a commission more often than not 10 to 15% percent so these platforms right now are trying to figure out how to monetize that um, what you're usually seeing is that there is either some sort of commission model or you're paying for certain functionality from a brand standpoint but there's some variance right now and i think we'll see some evolution in there but sure these platforms are, are trying to figure out how they monetize that as well I'm sure. Um, how do you think social commerce is impacted by recent data collection practices by Facebook? Um, do you think that customer sentiment will change? Yeah, so this is certainly probably a multi-billion dollar question here. I, I know I'm sitting on the fringe of this and wondering how all of this is going to be impacted. And for whatever reasons, they're really front and center, you know, on, on things like, like privacy. So it'll be interesting to see because even though consumers will express being disgruntled about information being captured by them, the balance of that is that we as consumers generally say we like things such as personalization. And then, and this is the part that I know we frown upon, but it's, but it's just a reality is that people are, I think we could say, are just addicted, you know, to social. So I'm wondering if we as consumers will really stop that behavior and move away from these platforms versus kind of being somewhat tolerant and continue to engage with it. And then maybe social commerce actually makes it an even more viable option for us. So something to keep our eyes on. And what... Obviously, Monday was a struggle for a lot of people, myself included, with Facebook and Instagram going down. You know, I couldn't do my shopping via Instagram. So how does that affect these brands and influencers kind of long term? Do they feel like they can't really trust these platforms or what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think we would all agree that if that was something that's pervasive, that's certainly going to be a be a problem. But but right now, if we if we look at engagement and how brands are responding to these social platforms, it's just really hard to turn a blind eye to the number of you know average daily or monthly users on these platforms. So even when they have glitches, you know, brands just sort of take it on the chin and go, okay, that wasn't optimal. But what's my response going to be? Am I really going to stop using it altogether? 
or am I going to continue to use this as a way to reach, engage, and build some brand uh, affinity with my consumers? So I think things like that are, are, are probably not going to be so impactful that companies just go, you know what, we can't depend on you. We're going to go a different direction. I think that's an anomaly. Okay, good, good to know because that's where I get all of my great ideas. So. <laughs> okay. um, well, there are a lot of other questions in the chat, so hopefully you'll be able to address those on LinkedIn later. But you know, um, our next Scheller lunchtime live session is Friday, October twenty second at twelve p.m. Eastern. The topic will be millennials at forty: the financial realities that Gen Y faces today. Featuring Scheller alumnus and founder and CEO of Illumit, Kevin Mahoney. Kevin will discuss the most prominent personal financial considerations that millennials, the oldest of whom are turning 40, face today and will offer his perspective on the most important financial tactics that many millennials miss or overlook. You can register for this event and learn more about future Scheller lunchtime live sessions by following the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business on LinkedIn. A recording of this session and future sessions will be available on our LinkedIn and YouTube pages as well. Thank you all for joining and thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.